Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast for the last stage of the second week. I am completely exhausted. Benji's probably fine. I've been on an it's been an emotional roller coaster this whole tour and another unbelievable stage. Tight, great break formation, drama, controversy, unbelievable in the ups. And this is on we don't these are not even quote unquote big mountain stages. The tour yeah. is almost going a different way, Benji. What do you make of these two stages? I know Juplan was hard yesterday, but back to back four thousand meter Denevelle stages, but no climb over thirty five minutes. And it's an no climb over 15, 1700. Exactly. And there's stages that fit one rider a tiny bit more than the other, and the other fits the other rider a bit more. But every single day, they prove to be so close together. And would they do that again on today's parkour? Because yesterday's efforts must be in the legs of Jumbo Domestiques, but might also be in the legs of Jonas and Tade. Eh? Exactly. And, you know, you remember on Core Terre. That mm -hmm. was after Jonas took a minute. Was Jonas fatigued after the day before? Now you can say it wasn't like Pagacha wasn't trying behind Jonas on Marie Blanc. I presume he was also going full gas unless he wanted to make this tour nice and exciting for, for podcasters. Thank you. Yeah, thank you if so. You're giving Jonas a head start. It's been made the next 10 stages really good. Anyway, today's stage, 180K from Legette, apparently the first... Uh, departure from there and finishing in Saint-Gervais Mont Blanc. The final climb is called Le Betex. I don't even know if this is really Mont Blanc. People that are more familiar with the Alps, Luke, our producer, will know because uh, this goes around Annecy. Anyway, it is an uphill start, but it's not that long and not that steep. Really, only like a 3 4k climb before a 30k. It's not a highway, but it, it's, it's a highway valley basically. And then the Col des Fleurs, Fleury. 9K is 4.6%. I really struggle with the Alpine pronunciation compared to the, the Pyrenean. Maybe mm -hmm. an etymologist of French language can explain why that is. Then a rolling valley all up and down. And then the first main categorized climb, the Col de la Forclas, which is 7.2K, 7.4%. Now that's a cat one. So some decent uh, points for that. The last 3K is average 10%. It's a fake news climb. A step descent up. And then the Col de la Croix, free. 11.4 kilometers, 7.1%, fairly regular with a couple of Ks steeper and a couple of Ks less steep than the average. Short descent in the Col des Aravi, 4.4K, 6%. That's a cat three. And then a steep descent, technical descent that actually caused a few problems in various groups today before a, a nasty, nasty false flat drag up to Mejev for 10 kilometers. And then a descent before the straight into the Côte des Amarons, 2.7 Ks, 10.1%. You get two in one, category two, and then the final climbs are category one. So it's a really soft cat one, this finish, I would say, yeah. especially given that you get the cat two points. To me, the whole climb is a cat one. Um, and it's all irregular. It's all up and down. It's a, nice, it's a very Pyrenean stage, Benji. But if you take a look at the parkour, I feel like there were three things for GC here. Either a team goes all out and tries to launch their GC leader on Crawford Aravi towards the satellite rider, which was unlikely based on how GC stands. There's a similar situation possible with that steep climb just before the final ascension to Betex. I think I texted you that once I saw Soler in the breakaway. But um, from that point onwards, it's the last climb that matters. So those three options are available. And we did see satellite riders in the breakaway, but it wasn't instantly because there was a first breakaway up the road, like seven, eight riders with Paulus for KOM. And you tweeted this morning that this would be a vital stage for KOM. Yeah. Ciccone, Paulus, Woods would be interested in this. Well, the first break, Ciccone missed, missed out. And yeah. his entire team started pacing Paulus. Kirsch was at the front, Steven was at the front trying to get the Paulus group back. And eventually they got him back and... Well, why is this an important stage for KOM? Just because of the number of points and because I was convinced the breakaway was going to go all the way today because mm -hmm. it's such a hard day to control all day. And, you know, three category ones, a category two and a category three, that's a lot of points. If we look at Cor Chevelle stage, yeah, okay, it's a beast and there's an HC with double points, which I think is wrong. I really don't agree with that. But, um, you know, <laughs> apart from I'd have to really look it up, but I, I think this might be the second healthiest in terms of points in the race. Probably wrong. I think I'm wrong. Yesterday was more. Anyway, I just was convinced <laughs> the break. It was more, I knew the break was going to go. I knew the break was going to yeah. go all the way. And, what, and because of that fighting, Benji, we didn't actually know what GC were going to do for quite a while. Because for a long time in this stage, because you've got this huge fighting, O'Connor gets in the break. 
and then you know palace is there and then the wrong riders are there for trek and you know, so there's all this trying to sort it out eventually a break does go in parts ala philippe uses a descent to get ahead again no problem with it he goes ahead with yeah. lutschenko i might be skipping a few bits benji i won't skip the crash then a, a huge break forms but it's it to me that big break was never gonna go i i felt like that big break mm -hmm. if it was gonna go it it went to 28 and then it was coming back again and Yumbo were trying with Van Bala to let it go and then people just kept jumping and it was down to 15, 17. I, I swear I wasn't confident that big break was going to go. How do you see that Van Bala pacing then? Because when he was pacing, I felt like the tempo was also pretty high to the point that the gap could have been a minute if Van Bala didn't do that. It was but to deter attacks. I think. Yeah, it, it, it has to be the kind of balance. Eh? It needs to be a balance pace to the point that nobody wants to bridge but on the other end you also want to have the gap just expand instantly so that people don't want to bridge as well so it's kind of like what is the better strategy here because sometimes i feel like just having it blocked up at the front might be better than keeping up the pacing i agree i think in, in at a point he was pacing a little bit too hard i think he should never be pacing the same pace as the breakaway and i yeah. feel like he was actually holding the gap stable at points um, but they were definitely going to let the breakaway win the stage, right? You, Yumbo has no interest in taking the stage here, right? Why, no, why would you? You know Poggy yeah. is you know, going to win most likely win the sprint in, in Saint-Gervais. Why would you want the bonies available yeah. to him? So it was really, I was looking at UAE. Are they going to really do an all-day shift here for the, for the stage? And I also, I didn't expect them to do it because it is, it's borderline impossible. And like we saw in stage 12, other teams mm -hmm. will literally just keep attacking you, yep. even if there's 60Ks left and there's no break because there's a Tour de France stage winner because you might be, you're going to be short on domestiques at that point. Anyway, this break that I, this large break I'm talking about, it has Van Aert in it. Now, Van Aert's tagged by Soler, and we've seen this throughout the tour where Van Aert goes or a Yumbo satellite goes, Soler goes, and he was very, very strong yep. today, very impressive from him. Frail is in there with Kwiatkowski, but Kwiatkowski was struggling. Pino, Paulus, Alaphilippe, Lander, Freed, Mean old Yumbo Visma chased him yesterday. Despicable. Poles, well, Poles, so two Bahrain, two very good riders from Bahrain. Pollitt, again, he keeps getting in breaks, Benji. Not as a satellite. I don't know what Bora doing with Pollitt and re protecting Hindley. Yeah. It's not like he can win this stage. Chicone, Schkel, Moser, and Juan Pei, great combination. They're the three they wanted. Vanderpool with Sir and Kra, Rui Costa. Aaron Baru, your boy, Benji, heard your criticism. Uh, Woods, Ul, Nalens, Kranik, Bagi, Lutschenko, Train, and Bergado. So we have the KOM boys, uh, yeah. uh, who did I say? Paulus, Ciccone, Woods. We have Stage Hunters, we have Pino, we have Guillaume Martin going for GC. And Pitcock tried to jump in this, Benji, I swear. Or yep. Hindley, and then Hindley and Yates were on him. I feel like not Bilbao? just Hindley and Yates, but also Bilbao and also Godu. They all tried to kind of make a move together with Pitcock towards a the friend then. I was kind of hoping it would work because that would have made an entire godlike stage. But like you say, Yumbo was interested in shutting that. They wanted to break that and have a large gap so that they don't necessarily have to control it at three, four, five minutes, even though they probably still wouldn't do it at five minutes, probably seven, eight, nine. But that being said, it's so much easier to control the breakaway. They're not in it. So they closed down that bridging. That didn't happen. And yeah, have we even mentioned the crash yet? We've, we've spoken well, no, so, so much. Also, we're setting it up. That's the group. Yep. That's the group that Van Bala was pacing a little bit behind. All of a sudden, they go through a little village. There's a crash at the front of the Peloton. Yumbo were at the front actually looking like they were blocking because they had numbers across the front. Sepp Kuss, a, a spectator, leans out. Don't know whether they're taking a selfie. Don't know whether they're cheering. Don't know. Anyway, send that guy to jail trying to take out GC Kuss. I'm not, I'm not even joking. Yep. Like, if Opiomi, it's the same thing. It's just less riders crash it. Correct. And less people badly injured, I, I hope. Takes out Koos, Koos back with Koos cannons into Nathan Van Hoydonk. Van Hoydonk goes down really hard. He flips over on his back, smashes his head, I think, into the yep. ground. And he's not moving as well. Koos is back up, looking okay, but Van Hoydonk looked fucked up. And I was like, he's not going to continue. Binny crashed, I believe. So Intermarche had been in the wars, man, with Menkes abandoned yesterday and Petit struggling. And yeah, it's just... I mean, we know the listeners of this podcast are, they're not the target for this, Benji, that, you know, put selfie sticks or flags into people's spokes yeah. if you are. 
turn off your subscription on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, where, wherever you listen or the YouTube. But I don't think our audience is, but, you know, it goes without saying, this sucks. I don't know what you can do. The, the tour runs these campaigns about respecting the riders too, Benji. There's so many people on the route that the you're law never, of averages says this might yeah. happen. You're never going to reach everybody. And a segment like that is destined to be unbarriered because they can't barrier off the entire park. No. They can do it for the last kilometer of a bonus second sprint. I'll keep that same point yeah, of yesterday. Yeah, sure. But the, in a random village that they're passing through, it's unlikely that they can barrier off the entire place. So it's not a... It's something that can happen. It just sucks. It's one of those sucky events that if you go to a bike race, just be responsible. Just be aware that these people on the road, you can severely injure these people. You can cause them lifelong career injuries if you stick out a flag or something like yeah. that and, and they crash over it. So if you do go to a race, then just be careful out there. Just watch the That's, race with yeah. your eyes. <laughs> I don't know why people, I know I'm such a boomer. And before we started the podcast, we had Fuck a big tech, tech thing <laughs> where, you know, I was like, Luke, I can't pull the Ethernet cable out and plug it back in because it'll turn my computer off. And he was like, bro, <laughs> um, <laughs> to check the connection. But just watch, confirm. The, just watch the race with your eyes. You will remember it in your brain. It's like a, it's like a, a phone. Yeah, but then I can't. For your brain has it in it, a chip. But then I can't gain social media points for being at a race, man. Social media is overrated. You can't make a career out of it anyway. All right. So this, um, <laughs> unfortunately, Van Hoydonk and Koos get back up. I don't believe there were any abandons that came out of that crash. But yeah, not not great to see. The side effect of this is that break goes. There's a they don't neutralize because there was a gap and a break up the road. It wasn't as bad a crash overall as yesterday. Excuse mm -hmm. me. But that break gets eight minutes or six minutes because. But no, Vingegaard and Co. come to the front. Van Hoydonk's coming back. Van Baal's coming back. Koos come back. Van Baal crash as well, I think. And yeah, UAE don't press on. Why would they? Um, because they weren't going to control the stage. So the jumping stops, the break goes. And it's an interesting break, Benji, because you've got two potential satellites, Van Aert and Soler. Mm -hmm. And you also have the KOM battle. And you also have a lot of good stage hunters. So when, I, when it went to eight minutes, the break is winning. Uh, that's, that's very, very clear. Do you want to do the breakaway? Well, we can do it in phases. I mean, what did you see then once Van Hoydonk came back and Yumbo taking control? To me, Yumbo were pacing harder than just pacing because Guillaume Martin's in the break at 15 minutes. Yeah, certainly. But we also see that from every single team that exists in this world. When, when there's a breakaway that is on 15 to 20 minutes in GC, people still keep it to eight minutes. And I've, al I've always found that interesting. I'm just obviously trying to look the best in two strategies. And I'd argue that, for example, the best possible thought process that Yumbo could have had is to add more kilojoules throughout the parkour to make it a tiny bit harder for Pogacar towards the last climb to maybe, like yesterday, reduce his acceleration a bit. That's the only thing I can think of outside of the fact that they could also just have him pacing a bit too hard in the first place, like other teams do all the time. Yeah. But then the gap started to come down. Uh, yep. And also, the, but the, the guys in the break, apart from Guillaume Martin, who didn't have a tugger, oh, he had Perez, I apologize, I think. But he can't do everything. They don't care if they win by 30 seconds or three minutes or eight minutes. So they don't need to take the gap out to 15 minutes. So everybody's chilling. Lushenko yep. and Alaphilippe, I, those directors, I'm sorry, there's a problem in Quickstep, Benji. What are those directors doing having Alaphilippe ride at 30 seconds in front of a breakaway of 20 plus strong riders in undulating terrain where the huge draft advantage where half the guys in the group behind are hiding and conserving because there's little trek tugging with one pay excellent tug of this tour what and what are they thinking with it Alaphilippe makes no and Lushenko? Sense. it's so it makes dumb. no sense because it's not only Alaphilippe eh? like Alaphilippe's one of the guys here but we also see moves by other riders. For example, we see Kosta at a certain point do a move early to try and get ahead and so forth. But it's also at a point where I'm like, Trek still has a domestique behind you. Skelmos, Juanpe, both are still there to do that work for Chicone. So at that point, Costa's move is just not worth doing because he's destined to be caught. And with Holler, you can kind of understand it because there's no other point of him being in the breakaway and just anticipating and hoping something happens behind because he's got no chance of doing anything. But 
a la Philippe, I, I agree. There's an issue there in the car, and I feel like it's not the first time we've said that in this Tour de France either. But I would say that all those attacks that did happen, like a Holler, like a Costa, like an a la Philippe being ahead for 30 seconds, uh, that kind of stuff, it was all controlled by Trek. Schiam yeah. was a setting pace, Juanpe setting pace, and Chicone basically secured virtually the KOM jersey ahead of Paolo's on these KOM points. That's the summary of the KOM battle fight. Eh? Be- they're even. Are they even they're at on, the end? They're on 58 each, I believe, really? according to PCS, yeah. Oh, the commentator on, on Belgian TV was he like, might, oh, I uh, He ahead. might be ahead on the tiebreaker, I okay. don't know. Um, but yeah. they're even on points. And we see that, that's why I tweeted that this morning, the KOM battle, unless you're a god, is not manageable with winning the stage. Like the effort required for Chicone doing all these sprints, doing lead outs, keeping the group going, pacing, mm-hmm. having his team pace, closing gaps to people like Kosta so Kosta doesn't get the points. It, you can't win the stage like that when someone like Walt Pauls doesn't take a pull all day. Like, so, you know, but, but he's going for KOM and I respect that. Like, it, I think it's a really prestigious award and I really like a top rider targeting it too. So, you know, yeah. I, I'm not criticizing, I'm just, Saying the reality of Mate, that, and it's your preview pick. So obviously you're happy. Chicone no is taking way I care him. Yeah, you did. I was take, I was picking Pino, and you picked Chicone. Do you reckon Pog off the podium pick? That one's not aging too well so far. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, shit, shit can still change, but it's looking pretty bad for that <laughs> I one. Don't think so. I don't think so. Um, the thing anyway, sorry. That Tom. follows is that I feel like the next attack that I do remember, we're getting on RV territory already. Uh, we we got over Quafri. We got some people dropping in a peloton like Godu showing some weakness, but then returning to the group like he does every single stage so far. Like, what, what is that? Why is Godu I don't understand. In every mountain stage, in the middle of the stage or the early part of the stage, looking weak, to then at the end of the stage show up and say, I'm the man. It makes zero sense to me. You proposed whether it's a warm-up issue or something like that. No, nah, it can't possible, be. We're, we're, but... we're two and a half hours in at this point. Yeah, he should be warmed up at that point. Uh, my, ex- my explanation is... Yumbo, this is a nice segue. Yumbo was setting a hard pace. Okay, yeah. it's not dropping lots of people, but the gap is coming down to a pel- to a breakaway, which does have Chicone pushing on. And so Laporte, Van Hoydonk drops, he can't do anything today. And, and I was curious, what would Yumbo do now with, would UAE sense weakness, Benji, with Koos questionable mm-hmm. after crashing, Van Baal's crashed lightly, Van Hoydonk's crashed heavily and he's gone for the stage. What would Yumbo do? What would UAE do? And Yumbo looked like they just kept to the same plan as yesterday, maybe a little bit less ferocious. Yeah, pacing, definitely. Pacing super hard. But it was still a heavy pace. And I believe that 5%, 6%, when someone like Van Bala is pulling, mm-hmm. really hurts Godou because he sits very unaerodynamically on the bike. I'm not sure what time... He is behind Genius. I'm not sure what sit he's taking in the bunch. I, I think those hurt. It must be that because then on the steep final climb, he's, he's really good. I'm going to tell you that if the crash doesn't happen at the start, Van Bala keeps pacing, Van Hoidong paces after him, and they do this regardless of what happens with the breakaway in terms of gap. They don't care about the breakaway. No. They, uh, no? They don't, no, I agree. I'm saying no. They don't oh. care about the breakaway, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that no was very ferocious, man. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so I, I just, based on what they did afterwards, I would have expected them just to keep on going, but that crash kind of dented their plan i think of doing that in this stage but in the breakaway we did see action from the satellite riders was the not i think where solaire decided to attack oh, he had fake. an advantage he, he was faking dude do you see him faking the whole climb on craft free the whole <laughs> climb and i'm like mark you won to lavenir you've won grand tour stages you set a ferocious pace on grand colombier three days ago you're not dropping before Ugo, who I like as a rider, but you're not dropping before him on seven percent. Come on, we know. And you, the tell <laughs> was on the top of Craft Free, he's been lollygagging at the back the whole time. He just moved onto Wout Van Aert's wheel in like twenty seconds up the whole line in the wind before <laughs> that descent for Aravi. And then yeah, he attacks Benji, and I was like, is he a satellite or is he going for the stage? Is he doing Solaire things where he's like, if I'm solo ahead, you can't call me back. I f- I reckon it might have been the latter because it doesn't make sense for him to attack on Aravi, no. even well, because you he had no signs of doing anything on Quafri and Aravi at He's that free point ride. in the race. Exactly. So 
I think he was trying to get, get ahead and, and see what that situation would bring. Because he, he did have company, but not instantly, right? Because it, they, he was getting over the top of Aravi, and Vinod shoots from the group behind, yeah. like proper speed. Nylans tries to follow instantly, but gets on a bit of a gap, but then returns to his wheel. And I think Pools was the next one to try and yeah, close bridged. that down as well. So those three riders go into the descent, go towards the man ahead, Solaire. And we get this four-man group for a bit, but Solaire is the weaker descender of the four. And I didn't know Solaire was that bad at descending. It's since his crash in plays Vasco. Oh, um, that explains. So uh, let's, hope he gets, let's hope he gets ahead of that again. But there was a crash in a descent, though. And it's a really weird one, right? Yeah, it's kind of like the J Vine one in the um, Welter a couple of years ago, where not a car this time, but Nalens, Nalens called for the bike. Let's start with that. Nalens calls yep. for the bike, the, the Vitel neutral water bike mm -hmm. on four wheels, I think. Yep. And it comes up and it's around a right to le a left to right bend. He's called it up. And they're not going full descending, but they're going fast. They're carrying a yep. lot of speed. And Nalen's one hand off the bars goes to take the bid on. And Nalen's, I, I don't like blaming riders, but to me, Nalen's moves basically diagonally towards the wall oh, yeah. into the bike and crashes him, like slides out. He clips the bike and slides out. So Inattentiveness leads to this moment from Nylans through this at this moment, this mistake in this corner. But I say it's about 90% Nylans' fault. But I'll be honest, I feel like it's 10% the fact agree. that 10% that a motorbike with water bottle should not be accepting no. the requests of Nylans to give water in that corner in the first place. Like, it's pretty obvious that it's not a place to give water bottles to riders. So 90% Nylans, 10% there should probably be a rule in cycling that water bottles shouldn't be given in those kind of descents. I mean, yeah, like, it's, it's, a, it's a dangerous point. But then again, I don't know, like... Maybe that guy's given out a, a thousand bid-ons in a descent and everyone calls him in, in the descent for a shell. I don't know, but I agree with you. I, I was like, that's a weird spot <laughs> when a rider's called you up for you to move up just immediately on his request. I was like, that's... Anyway, it's really unfortunate. He goes into a, a, basically a wall and it stops yeah. him going over the edge, which is brilliant, and he gets back up and well, I think finishes the stage. It's, it's brilliant that it stops him from going over the edge, but it probably still hurt quite a bit. And oh, yeah, yeah. But I thought when he was crashing, I mean, he could break. I thought he, yeah. when he hit that wall, I was like, your shoulder's done. See ya. Yeah. But he got back up, so he, he mustn't have broken his collarbone. So thankfully, he's still in the race. I'm also always questioning when I'm watching these races. When I watched it yesterday, Daniel Martinez is crashing that early, big crash at the start of yesterday's stage. Then we see Van Hoydong's crash. Then we see this crash from Nylans. I'm always hoping that there's a proper concussion test because yesterday Martinez had time He's to get tested. Race. I don't know if he properly got tested. Maybe he got properly tested on the road concussion test, but there were no signs yet. But afterwards, he was taken out after the stage for having a concussion or signs of a concussion. So I'm just hoping that every single time someone crashes like this, that they take concussion seriously because they're worse than you, than you probably think. To be fair to Ineos, I think they're quite good with it. Yeah. From what I've seen, I think Ineos are quite good with taking it very seriously. Um, it's also, is Ineos instantly there and maybe the medical person of the race? Like, it's, it's not always Ineos that gets to choose to yeah, put a ride a on a bike guy. instantly. Yeah? yeah, so, I don't know. Anyway, Nalens crashes. That brings that gap, that group down to three riders. We'll, kind of, we'll focus on this, uh, we'll focus on the breakaway first and, and go back to GC. So, Nalens pulls Soler. Soler, at this point to me, I'm like, both well, Van Aert and Soler are going for the stage. You can't convince me otherwise. They, they have an eight-minute gap, seven-minute yeah. gap. Both of them have a 33% chance to win the stage, let's say. They're going for the stage. And then there's this false flat plateau. Again, an uphill drag. Soler comes back. Soler and Wout are, are pulling hard. So this is why I was the tell. I was like, everyone's pulling hard. Maybe pulls a little bit less because he's got Lander behind. And that group behind was chaotic, Benji. Full group two syndrome. Martin was trying to keep it going because he was trying to move up on GC. Ciccone and Trek had no legs anymore. It, it was a mess. Like, and then I think someone crashed on a descent. Maybe Martin went straight in a hairpin. That mm -hmm. let Ull off the front. Gap. They, they were done. Never coming back. Gap ballooned in the valley to like 130. And then in the descent before Amaron, before the climb started, Van Aert attacked again. Because he wanted to get rid of Soler. Um, and they, 
obviously so we saw Soler's weakness in the previous descent. So to get ahead of him and also in the in the run into Amaron, you can really kill a guy with with two guys working ahead, you can put him under a lot of pressure. So maybe I would also say Benji, Wavana did way too much in this stage. Way too much. I don't know Probably. why. When he the wants gap to win was, the stage. I know he wants to win the stage, but when the gap is eight minutes, yep. going let's go two hours back, the gap is eight minutes. Trek have numbers, EF have numbers, you're not interested in KOM. Yep. Why is Sol Soler never took a pull before he attacked? Never took a pull. Why would he? Yep. And when you see satellites normally, they never take a pull. And you can play that card and then go for the stage. And I don't know why he was up front bossing the break, closing gaps. I was like, that's not your job. Like, and I also think, I also think other guys would have shut it at that point. It was too early in the stage. They wouldn't have been like, oh, you're Van Aert. I'll let Chicane literally just walk off with the stage. I completely agree. And it came to the point that we had Wout and Wout ahead because Soler was behind because of that descent. Nas was behind because of the crash. So Wout versus Wout is looking like a battle we'll have for the, for the stage. And I was curious, what is Soler going to do now? Is he going to wait or so? But he kept on trying to get back and he kept on sitting about 20 seconds, 10 seconds, sometimes seven seconds behind them on the flat section towards the, the steep start of the final climb. Because like you said, it's in two parts. First 2.7-ish kilometers at 10%. Very then steep. we've got the actual non-rampa non in Humana, the, the proper Humana climb, the human climb at the end. So that steep section, that's in Wout Pulse's favor. That's yep. obvious. Because the dude's much lighter than Wout Van Aert. So physics says that Wout Pool should be able to get up that easier. Then again, there's a lot of light riders that dropped when Wout Van Aert was pulling yesterday. But, <laughs> but Wout Pool's is a competent rider. He's inconsistent, though, I swear, because I feel like I haven't seen him for this entire Tour de France. But now he's at the front and he's fighting for a potential stage win. And I was shocked at this point because at this point I went on to uh, first cycling and I took a look and I... I saw that he had not won a Grand Tour stage ever. This man has been at the front of Angliru, <laughs> pacing for absolute legends in the sport. He's been doing that for Sky back in the day. Like, what the hell, man? Yeah, but when you, when you hear Thomas talk on what's occurring, then you understand why. It's very conservative, the mindset, back in the day and still so. He's free. Well, he's also inconsistent, Benji. Like, he won yeah. Andalusia last year. On a stage when he beat Lushenko in a sprint, then kind of disappeared a little bit. And then this year, he came seventh on Jabel Hafit and sixth in GC at UAE Tour. And there were good riders there. And yep. so that's a good result. You don't just luck into that result. And then not too much else. Now, obviously, he's working as a domestique often for Lander or whoever. Um, but yeah, he comes through here and just, he's not shown much this tour at all, save the legs and just drops Van up. And that's the reality is that. Van Aert is a brilliant rider, but also Wout Pools is, on his day, like he is a better climber, uh, especially on 10% sustained, and he was certainly on his day. And he goes away, Benji, and wins this stage easily by like he drops Van Aert by two minutes. The gap was with three and a half Ks left. I thought Van Aert, he held it at 30 seconds on the steep section, then it goes 7K, 7%. I was like, all right, if this gap, if Van Aert has any chance, the gap mm -hmm. needs to start moving down pretty quickly on the 7% sustained section. And it didn't. It actually yeah. started going the other direction. And then I was like, he's, Pools is running away with this. Forget yeah, about but, group, the, the break, other breakaway as well. They're done. But at that point, I'm thinking, at what point should Soler and Wout start thinking about what's happening behind? Where UE is starting to show signs of wanting to do something with the race and maybe draw back? Or should they stay in second position? Uh, Wout Van Aert, for example, in case something happens to our pools, because it's always possible that he punctures uphill. It's very unlikely, but it's not impossible. So you're kind of balancing that out. I would probably choose to help the leader behind once the gap is around 50 seconds, something like that. I feel like Wout tried a bit longer than that. Soler even tried a bit longer than that to hold on to Wout Fanat. We'll also in a lost position. And let's switch to the, the peloton first, no? Or should we well, finish yeah, on the breakaway point. first? Fanat didn't wait. I think he mm -hmm. should have. When the gap okay. was when it was three and a half k's left, one minute to pulls. I think he should have waited. Yep. He has a gap of six minutes to the GC group. You don't know what Coos is like. Jonas could get dropped. Uh, two seconds, one second. I mean, you can say how much can he help? 
He might help a little bit. I don't know. Um, Agreed. And UAE did put in the order for Soler did wait. He did. And yep. he waited at, at the top of this climb uh, when he was done. So he put in the clutch a bit earlier. Anyway, GC. Jumbo Visma have been, been pacing all day. They've been quite impressive with Van Bala, Bernard looking good. They get to the base of the climb. UAE time. And I was like, it's very, <laughs> very similar to Mont. And Björk comes through, big chain ring, bang, drops into the small chain ring, bang, on the steep section. Pelton blown out the water. Gadu looking good. Hinley there. Rodriguez there. Pidcock struggling a little bit. Björk pulls off. Grove Schartner starts pulling. And then I was like, Poggy's not going to go long again. Because the growth, there was a period of the UAE pacing, Benji, where no one additional was dropping. It's very, this is what often happens when UAE pace. They drop everyone that's going to be dropped, and then it's the status quo group for quite a while. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because we saw the same thing with Micah yesterday, for example. He put that initial burst, a bit higher tempo, and then it, then it slows down a tiny bit. But like you said, we had Björk, then we had Grosschartner, who's been having a really good Tour de France, to be honest. So credits Solid. to Felix, because I, I've been really impressed. Medium mountain domestique, but I swear that he survived pretty long yesterday for a medium mountain domestique. And when it comes to the further parts of this climb, we see that Micah takes over. And Micah's pool was, was relatively long, but I swear that it then switched to Adam Yates quicker than I expected. And Adam Yates did it for quite a while. And Let's, let's indicate for a second, when Micah takes over, the group goes down to Pogacar, Vingegaard, Kuss, Rodriguez, Godu, and Benoit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, Hinley, Hinley dropping, Peacock came back and dropped. And how's Benoit Bill there? Dropped. Pardon? <laughs> How is Benoit, Benoit still there? Good after fatigue. <laughs> Actually shocking that he was still there. I was super shocked. Godu, after being weak middle of the stage, once again there. <laughs> Same exact thing, huh? I don't understand it. I, I anyway, <laughs> uh, good on him because, like, yeah, good on him. And yeah, Pidcock dropped again, but he actually was finishing. I need to see the overall results, but yeah, Kelderman gone before Benoit. Coos is there looking. I mean, Coos is there, but I'm like, I don't know if he's going to be prime Sep Coos, the eagle of Durango flying. And it, anyway, that guy shouldn't be riding for Giannis, right? For his own GC results at this point. Me and and he crashed today. That. Yeah, yeah, because of the crash. So he's got to defend his GC. Um, <laughs> Micah's pool, Benji, to me was, you're right, it wasn't a typical one where normally he blows the doors off everybody. Yeah. Initially, it was very low cadence, very low cadence too. Um, and then, yeah, Yates takes over and that's when, you know, Yates is the third best climber in this race. Yates is better than Coos the last two days. Yep. And he drops everybody except Vingegaard and Pagacha. Pagacha has Soler ahead right now. Jumbo Visma still have Van Aert up the road. This is long though. I don't, because it's difficult because the kilometer markers were sort of the poles, but this was with, for the GC guys, 5Ks to go. Yeah. Like a good portion of the Betex climb left. Yeah, there was a pretty large portion left and that's where it starts getting intriguing, right? Because Adam Yates sets that tempo. He keeps that tempo for a bit. But Pogaccio at a certain point lets his wheel go. And this was true like a, a little bit of a bend to the right side, and I'm like... I thought Poggy was going to attack, because he lays off before he attacks. Exactly. So either Pogacar attacks from that wheel, but he decides not to do that, and he lets Adam Yates just ride up the road. And now I'm thinking, oh, they're trying to make kind of a, a relay station, yeah. kind of a, a rider up the road, so that Pogacar can attack from Vingega towards Adam Yates to be able to sustain the gap that he makes, unlike what happens yesterday. That's the thought process I'm having live as the race is ongoing. And about a minute later, I see Adam Yates in the wheel of Solaire. I had completely yeah. forgotten Solaire existed at this point. That's <laughs> the beauty of satellite riders that get dropped out of the breakaway. They don't have a camera on them. And exactly. So everyone forgets about them. And from that point onwards, how confident were you that when Pogaccio attacks towards oh no, Adam Yates and Solaire? Okay. You're assuming that you're forgetting the Pogaccio bluff. Pogaccio was faking. Yeah, of course. But, but no, but he was, that was a, he was like looking down, he flicked Vingegaard, he was Yeah, fake. but not a it single was, soul believed he was, he was really suffering. But then what, I don't, I, I think Vingegaard played this really not, not the best. I think Vingegaard yeah. had good legs at the end here. I don't know what he was doing. I don't know what he was doing. He was caught in two minds. Yeah. He doesn't take over from Pogaccio 
totally fine. Okay, you, you know he's bluffing. You're not going to drop him, I don't think. And based on Pagatch's later bur burst, you're probably not going to drop him. Um, <laughs> and so why, when Rodriguez comes back, do you take Rodriguez's wheel or not counter hard off Rodriguez's wheel just once? And it, instead, Vingegaard goes in front of Pagatcha now, has to look behind him. The rest of the climb is no longer in his wheel. Yeah. Does random little surges, which you're not going to drop him with, but also is Pagatcha's recharging the turbo now yeah, on but the climb. I, I don't know what Vingegaard was doing. Either attack, go full beans, attack him, and you've got to do it straight away so he doesn't recharge, or just stick in his wheel and be confident you're faking, not going to be tricked, I'm in your wheel. I agree. And a bit later, we saw that the fact that he wasn't attacking benefited the chase of Adam Yates and Soler because Carlos Rodriguez came back. He came back to the group of Pogacar and Vingago and he started pacing for them with Vingago in the wheel of Rodriguez and Pogacar in the third wheel because Rodriguez is thinking, I got to get back to Adam Yates as fast as possible because this man, he's not close to me in GC, but I want to make yeah, sure he, he doesn't get close to me in GC. How close? Two minutes, right? 20, 19 seconds. Oh shit, Wait. I thought it was two minutes, my bad. <laughs> anyway, no. that explains that he was pacing I, hard. Everyone laughed at me saying GC <laughs> Jates was good. Okay, yeah, Mate. listen, he hasn't been better than Poggy, I'll grant you. But he's been pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, I, I, I give up. I apologize for assaulting Erasure, Jates man. here. But that is happening, and we're still waiting. We're still waiting for Pogacar to go, and it comes to the point where we're now in the last 1.5 kilometers, two-ish kilometers, something like that. And Four minutes. If we're talking in time. And that's where the, Poggy, Puy de Dome was four minutes. Yeah. Grand Colombier was one minute. Cotteret was four minutes. Four minutes, now we're in the zone. But the gap between Pogacar and Adam Yates and Soler has become smaller because of Carlos Rodriguez. Yeah. I feel like that put a dent on what Pogacar was trying in the first place because the gap wasn't big enough, in my opinion, to be able to successfully make that move happen anymore. No, I disagree. Okay. He had plenty of time to gap Vingegaard off. He gapped Vingegaard off the wheel yesterday in the first 10 seconds of his acceleration. Yeah, but yesterday, I believe that Vingegaard chose to stop earlier than and chug, he could chug. have stopped to not choke completely. Maybe. That was the final 2K. Maybe. I think, I think, there, I think UAE did a pretty good job. Maybe Rodriguez messed up a little it. bit. Maybe, maybe, yeah, I like what UA were, were, were trying to cook up there. I think Rodriguez also kept setting a high tempo, so the speed is higher. And so when Pogacar is attacking, he's, if, if Vingegaard is basically riding at 250 watts in front of Pogacar, Pogacar's fully f freshened up, yep. and he hits him from behind, the, the pace differential is so much bigger. But Rodriguez is riding at over 6 watts per kilo on the front. And so, yes, I... Maybe Vingegaard went in his wheel because he didn't want Poggy to let his wheel go. I don't know. But Pogacar throws in that big attack. He was bluffing. Vingegaard, this time Benji, this response from Vingegaard reminded me a lot more of Vingegaard in week two and three last year. Straight on the wheel, virtually overlapping, looking a little yeah. bit more comfortable. The speed was high. So unfortunately for Poggy, actually, unlike Puy de Dome, the draft benefit was very, quite high for Vingegaard. We're over 30 kilometers an hour here. and. Poggy gets over to Yates and Soler. Who pulled him? Soler. What? Who, event, who was the UAE rider that actually pulled Pogacar? Soler or Yates? It was Yates. I think Soler dropped off it was and Soler. Yates took over. Luke says it was Soler. So I'm why sure. was Soler pacing Yates? Good question. To keep him ahead? I don't know. I've actually no clue. Maybe they're listening to me and they want to go dual leader strategy and they want to <laughs> get Yates GC ahead. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. But yeah, Soler pulled Pogacar a little bit, but then it's not fast enough. That's the problem in, in the satellite rider in this, in this zone. It's not flat, so on 8-9%, like, Poggy's just going to go faster than Soler, even if Soler's yeah. been waiting. So Then Vingegaard was there looking easy, Benji, and I thought, it's time to counter, if you can. And Vingegaard actually, at the end, did try to throw in a little counter to the finish. Yeah, but I think we need to talk about that, because, yes, the rest of the stage goes as followed, Pools won the stage ahead, get seen for two seconds on screen, Poor and guy. they switch back to the GC fight. On one end, it's hilarious. On one end, it's really sad to think about Wout Pools' family waiting in the couch to see their, their boy finish their stage, his first Grand Tour stage win. 
and then they see him for two seconds before it switches back to the GC. We always want to see the GC, but this felt Dude, they, they didn't show him between the flam rouge <laughs> and the line. Not they once. showed Burgado more, who finished uh, third. It was uh, Sometimes I'm complaining about showing fourth and fifth. They shouldn't, but you should show the winner a little bit more. But now we got to talk about the GC situation until the end. Like you say, Pogacar tries again for his final sprint. Like, I swear it was, it was a proper sprint that he was trying to push, but it also wasn't the same burst as his first attack anymore. So the second burst is obviously, obviously going to be a bit less than the first one because he hoped to drop Vingegaard the first time around. And Vingegaard stayed on the wheel. Pogacar, yeah, he just didn't have it to be able to drop Vingegaard here. And Vingegaard switches over him towards the finish line. But why does Jonas Vingegaard not attack Pogacar? I think it's, one, when? he's probably not feeling great after being attacked instantly, but also on the other end, I think he has a fear of getting countered to the point that last year, Peguer, for example, obviously it's a different situation, an earlier situation, his character development, at that point he's not dominating mountains severely yet, so at that point he's probably still a bit fearful. But at that point, we both believed that he could have dropped Pogacar on that climb, but probably was too scared to try it. And I feel like there's been moments in this Tour de France where if Pogacar was Vingegaard, he would have attacked. Yesterday, Pogacar would have attacked Vingegaard. When, Pogacar came, when Vingegaard came back to Pogacar yesterday, if that was Pogacar, Pogacar would have hit him straight away. He would have I think gone... Pogacar has a better race mind than Vingegaard. He's better at seeing whether... It's a good moment to attack in the moment, regardless of the initial plan. I think so. He's got, I mean, he won Tour of Flanders. He has pretty good race feel. So that's never been in doubt. He won this many pro races. But I don't know. I think you say, oh, why didn't Ving when Yates goes, can Vingegaard attack? He can. Yeah, but why? He can, but, some, but first of all, Pogaccia still, when Pogaccia attacked, it wasn't like he was fucked. He yeah. sprinted full gas for 30. So he's going to be on your wheel. He's going to be getting draft. He has teammates ahead. Unless you feel a million bucks and you're, you don't think he's bluffing. I actually, yeah. I actually don't think Pogaccia felt that good. Um, to be honest, on the heavy pace of Yates. But I don't think Vingegaard drops him there. Zhu plan yesterday. Yeah, I, I we, already, we already said maybe you, you, you should try. And, you know, I think he, he, he should have if he could have. But. Don't know if he could have, but today, I don't know. I think I don't know. it's already a win for Jonas Vingegaard that he doesn't lose time to Pogacar at this oh, finish because victory this for sure. was definitely a finish where Pogacar should have taken time on Vingegaard for his benefit. It's a better finish for him. It was kind of like Grand Colombier where I expected three, four seconds in a final punch like that, but Vingegaard stayed on his wheel and I'd argue this is a moral victory for Jumbo Visma, but it doesn't mean anything, eh? The time trial is coming. Corla Loz is coming. That's gonna be some crazy shit with the gaps we've got, mate. Well, we should do. I'll do the stage. Pauls wins ahead of Van Aert, second. Burgado third. Craddock fourth. Lander fifth with Pino sixth. Martin, uh, then Schilmer, Zaguglielmi, Bagi, Ciccone finished on five thirty-five behind the breakaway. So that goes to show how much the KOM battle takes it out of you in terms of GC. Pog Vingegaard same time. Adam Yates twenty seconds back. Carlos Rodriguez thirty-eight seconds back. That goes to show you know he was with them with. Kato or something mm -hmm. and gets yeah. put on 38 seconds. Crazy. Uh, Sepp Kuss finishes fifth of the GC guys on 7.05, so a minute and one back at, uh, behind them. 10 seconds ahead of Godou. Uh, 20 ahead of Bill Bow. Gold does a decent performance again. Yates and Pidcock worked away. Who lost a lot of time today? Let me have a look. In terms of GC, Vingard maintains his 10 second gap ahead of Pagacha. C Rod. Lose a bit of time to Yates, but still stays in third. But Hindley loses a lot of time. Uh, so Yates is on 19 seconds behind Rodriguez in fourth. Hindley is in fifth on 6.38. So he's over a minute behind Rodriguez now. Coos solidifies his sixth position on 9.16. Now nearly a minute ahead of Bilbao in seventh, but quite a bit away from Hindley. But maybe fifth is possible if Hindley still suffers from that crash. Yates in eighth moves down. That's Simon. Uh, 30 seconds behind Bilbao, and then Godou actually moves into ninth on 14.07. Guillaume Martin moves into 10th in a very Guillaume Martin way from the break. 
on the 14th, yeah, 18th. But the reason that Felix Gall loses his two positions is because he did have a mechanical, I think, in the descent. Was it the descent no, no, split, after the sleep section? Split it. I saw uh, our commentator said he had a mechanical, so I'm going off that, but I could be wrong. I swear Simon Yates was caught out again and goal. Okay. Yumbo Visma split it again. Um, well, no, he could, he could have also had a mech as well. I think it was in the moments where we saw Pitcock go over the top of the, the steep climb, the steep 2.7 kilometer climb. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then, sorry, I'm, I'm talking about before. So, yeah, yeah he must yeah, have yeah. a mech. I think so. Unfortunately, because, like, well, to be fair, you can still put it right, even though he's going to lose a decade again in the time trial. But GC wise, like you said, that is the way it stands. If we take a look at what's coming, and obviously tomorrow's a rest day, so tomorrow they can all relax, do media stuff and stuff like that. But the day afterwards is a time trial, right? Stage 16, Passy to Comblu, 22.4 kilometers. It's not a flat time trial. It's not a pure mountain time trial either. The first two kilometers are flat. Then we've got the first hill, Côte La Cascade de Coeur, 1.3k, 8.5%, pretty steep. Then we've got a, a rolling descent, I would say, towards the halfway point of the race where there's a bit of a valley of roughly five to six kilometers. And then we've got the final climb, which is, it's kind of the Côte de Domancy climb, 2.8 kilometers at 8.5%, plus another 3.5 kilometers of climbing that is about 5%, I would say. So there is climbing at 8.5%. What do you reckon when it comes to bike changes? No, I don't think they'll do it because of the flat. Really? Yeah, I think. Because uh, there's what, from 3.5Ks to 16, no, to mm -hmm. 17Ks is not very steep. Yeah. I don't think they'll do it. Um, the overall climb 6K is 6.6%. I don't know how light the TT bikes are. I think this is the best possible TT for Pogaccia because it's two punches and then sort of false, not false flat, but big ring maybe climbing um, after that. So the two short punches are really good for him. The descent is non-technical and quite high speed, I think. So... His weight advantage on Vingegaard also helps, and then in the valley. So I think it's a really good TT for Pogacar. It's very similar to the parkour of the um, Slovenian national champs TT, which he just smoked. Well, against yeah, but he, beat, he beat his he beat his previous record. I mean, he's I had a warm up on it. Um, <laughs> I, I think yeah, Pogacar is the favorite for the TT, and and yeah, he I think he'll win it. Yep, I um, I think Pogacar is above thing and go for me as well but i do feel like the thing with yumbo visma time trials this year we've said it numerous times i've always felt like there's been 90 percent of the time trials this year they did obviously not the roguelage mountain time trial and there's also been a good roguelage zero time trial in there as well that was flatter but the rest of the time trials i was always like oh this is kind of one two percent under what i expected and that also pushes me to saying pogac will have an edge on this time trial regardless of Thing ago last year, doing better time trials than Pogacar. I still have that feeling for this time trial. So, could be wrong, but I agree with you that Pogacar should have the edge on this time trial. But when it comes to other GC positions, do you see like major change in GC? Because like we've seen good time trials from Carlos Rodriguez and the Vuelta last year, for mm -hmm. example. Hindley's had better time trial skills this year. Rodriguez should be able to keep a minute and 17 gap on that time trial on Hindley especially knowing the crash of Hindley happened recently. He's 19 in front of Yates. Adam Yates' time trial is... He will smoke is it. good, eh? Yates will smoke it. I think he'll podium the TT. That's possible. That's, I don't know, podium? He's going to be close, but it's podium 600 is 600 meters eh? climbing, and he's like 60 kegs, and the UAE setup is fast. And he's gonna, he can go into the podium on GC. Possible. And UAE also really care about that too. I think, I think Yates is going to do a really good TT. Is it, um, sorry, is it beneficial for Jumbo Visma that Adam Yates gets to the third spot in GC so that Yui has to think about more things? Well, I think that they'll just keep doing what they've been doing, which is, I don't really know what they were doing with Yates today, to be yeah. honest, because Soler was up there. I don't, I don't really know. Um, maybe Pog was not bluffing. I doubt it. I think they'll just keep using Yates as a domestique, 
But then he keeps writing. He keeps writing, you know. And, and listen, when you're dropping everybody else who's a podium contender and you just keep writing, it's not a problem right now. So, of course, if Yates is somehow in the Alsace stage caught yeah. behind a split, they're not going to drop all their team back to help him maintain third. But you know, they, that's a very fringe scenario. They'll support him maintaining third as long as it doesn't hinder Poggy. Uh, yeah. Koos Benji, can he maintain a minute on Bilbao and Simon Yates, a minute and a half on Simon Yates? I actually think after his Giro TT, I don't know how banged up he is. He was still dropped those guys on the climb today. I think Koos is going to do a good TT. The thing with Bilbao is that he was a good time trialer back in the day, but I feel like recently yeah. he's had weaker time trials in the last year and a half. So that's also what defines it. If he can find his old form back or whether the equipment of Bahrain and get him to a, a decent spot. That's a that's a very big, very big question mark for me. And when it comes to the fight for top ten, then Gal Martin and Godou are not exactly the best time trialists. But I feel like Godou might be the best one of the three because Felix yeah. Gal has said he does hasn't worked on his time trial skill at all, and they will do that at the end of the year because apparently his TT position is horrible or something. He said, and they don't have the time to fix it throughout the season, something like that, if I recall correctly, from Tour de Swiss. So I think that will stay roughly the same, but the fight we're all watching is Vingegaard versus Pogacar, and I feel like the it will be really interesting if Pogacar goes into the yellow jersey after the time trial, hypothetically, how he will ride on Cold Lalos. Because at that point, you start thinking, what if he starts playing... Because Cold Lalos feels like a moment where he should be defensive if he's in the lead. Because, yeah, it's... What, what do you reckon? What, what do we well, see on Cold Lalos? How much time gap do you reckon he takes? What's the range? He's currently 10 seconds behind, right? So I think he can take 25 to 45 is my range. I, I think, I've got I it think closer. He, you think 45 is way too much? I do think 45. If, if, if he takes 45, Vingegaard's had a, sh a shocker. I think the max that Pogacar is ahead in GC for me in my head is 10 seconds after the time trial. He only takes 20 seconds in the TT. I guess like uh, Vingegaard the... is still a good time trialist and is a mountainous yeah. TT. I'm probably being too conservative, yeah. I think you are. But hey, Pogacar's had outrageously amazing time yeah. trials in the past, so it's always but possible. So Vingegaard, Vingeg <laughs> too, like in the tour and the back yeah. end of the tour. If Pogacar's 10 seconds ahead for lows, that's uncomfortable. I think it, that's an uncomfortable gap. And also... Yeah. But also, it, it's so tiny, the differences then still, because what if Vingegaard takes 20 seconds on Kola Lose, then Pogacar's 10 seconds behind for stage 20. And like you said, that's a horrible situation to be yeah. in Priambo Visma then on stage 20. <laughs> so, Van Hoydonk might not be there to control it. You oh, know, Jesus knows? Christ. So <laughs> I think it's going to be a cracking TT to watch. My uh, dark horse for a top three is Schelmerzer. He came yep. third in the Tour de Suisse up and down TT um, and whacked the climb on that. He did faster than Ayuso and Remco on the climbing part of that time trial. So Schelmerzer, I think, will do a very, very good time trial. Um, and he had decent legs today. So, yep, Pogacar most likely will be the favorite for the stage. Uh, I mean... It also wouldn't surprise me if Vingegaard won the TT, Benji. He ha Let's not act like he hasn't beaten Pogacar yeah, in TTs yeah. before. Like, I'm not saying this is a sure run thing, but I, I do think, I don't know. I don't know. And Vingegaard's in the, or oh, they're both in the organizer skin suit, so that, that evens out. Um, yeah, any, I mean, the, the battle is finally poised, Benji. We won't have a rest day podcast tomorrow, but, but man, this second week has been, been crazy. Matteo Jorgensen has not been on the level of Romani in this race, I would say. But his time trial there, that mountain time trial that I use a one in descent, was nah, fucking I don't good. Think so. No, no, that was good, but I don't there's too much uphill at the end. The the watts will be mm -hmm. too different from the GC. I think guys. so. I think GC guys win this, you're right. Yeah. Like Van okay. Art I, Van Art won't won't be able to compete for a a podium result, I don't think, on this. Anyway. G C Coos wins the T T. <laughs> Let the eagle of Durango fly. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's all from us. What a second week. Thanks for all your support. It's been unbelievable, hectic, and man, the Tour de France, we could not hope for a more finely balanced race oh. going into that third week. Enjoy the rest day. We're going to be taking one uh, tomorrow. And yeah, we'll see you with the recap of stage 16 on Tuesday. Till then, ciao.